can see that. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joan Chrysler. I'm a professor of psychology at Connecticut College in, in London. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the session on women's psychology and the women's liberation movement, transforming psychology, transforming society. Uh, I thought I would begin with a little anecdote from my past, a women's liberation history note, maybe. Um, my husband and I had the occasion to meet Bella Abzug in the early 1980s. And I, of course, I rushed up to tell her how much I admired her work. And after listening to that, she said to me, what do you do? I said, I'm a psychologist. Then she said to my husband, what do you do? He said, I'm a lawyer. I'll try. Okay. So he said, I'm a lawyer. And then she said, huh, which one of your professions do you think has done more damage to women? <laughs> so I said, his, and he said, hers. All right. So why would she say that to a nice young psychologist like me, right? Some of you remember Phyllis Chesler's uh, classic book, feminist book, Women in Madness, which was... Uh, about how easily an inconvenient and unruly wife could be diagnosed and removed to a psychiatric hospital. Kate Millett's book, a uh, classic book, Sexual Politics, and also Simone de Beauvoir's classic book, The Second Sex, had large sections about psychology. Naomi Weistein, who was mentioned yesterday, uh, wrote a, an important paper titled The Fantasy Life of the Male Psychologist, in which she complained that he thinks he knows all about women, even though he's never asked us anything about ourselves. So by the time uh, in the 1960s when the women's liberation movement began to coalesce and gather steam, psychology had already spent about 100 years on theory building and research that was all based on men's experiences. Most of the psychology professors at the time were men, so were most of the college students, who, along with the rats, of course, made up uh, the participants in all the scientific studies. The men were um, all of the journal editors. They were writing all the textbooks. Freud and Erickson and their important theories on personality development were all based on men's experience, and women were clearly an afterthought. The associations and institutions to which we belonged were all male-dominated, and women were marginal at best. I'm talking about higher education and also think, groups like the American Psychological Association and the Psychoanalytic Societies. So you might wonder then, how did women like the women on this panel manage to have successful careers when we began in a toxic environment like well, we did it in solidarity with other women. We did it by consciousness raising, by starting new associations where we would be welcome and could serve as a power base. We did it by pushing the boundaries of theory and researching topics of interest to women, by founding new journals that would publish our work, by starting women's studies programs, and by teaching the, the new psychology of women to generations of students. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today. The format will be uh, 15 minutes per speaker, and we'll save our questions until the end so we can have general conversation. Uh, we want to have plenty of time for your comments and questions, so I'm going to enforce the time barrier. I've already told the speakers that. So I'll introduce them all now in order to save some time. Our first speaker is Irene hansen fries Irene is professor of psychology and director, and she has been director of women's studies at the University of Pittsburgh. She's going to talk about the beginning of her feminist organizing when she was a graduate student in Los Angeles. Our next speaker is Leonor Tiefer, who's affiliated with New York University School of Medicine and a psychotherapist in private practice. And she's going to tell us about the founding of the Association for Women in Psychology, which remains a vibrant group today. Next, we'll hear from Maureen McHugh, who is a professor of psychology and a former director of women's studies at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Maureen's going to talk to us about the transformation of psychological science and theory. And then we'll hear from Susanna Rose, who is the dean of the School of Integrated Sciences and Humanity at Florida International University. 
She's also a professor of psychology and a former director of women's studies. And she's going to talk to us about the importance of teaching the psychology of women, its importance to the students, and also for the women's movement. So um, welcome, everybody, and let's start with Irene. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, there are handouts up here for those of you that came in late. Uh, there's several handouts on the table here. Excuse me. wants to get those. Excuse me. I'm trying to adjust the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm going to talk about things back in the starting in the 60s and the early 70s. And yeah, I'm going to be talking about my experiences in Los Angeles. And from what I've been hearing at the conference so far, I think some of the experiences there are very different than what was happening in most of the rest of the country. Uh, so I, I want to set a little social context here before I talk about this, just so you get a sense of what that time was like. So there were many liberation groups at that time in Los Angeles. I think the focus was a little more personal there and a little less kind of societally uh, political as I'm hearing a lot of the talks here have been focused. So it is a different context. There were a lot of anti-war protests going on. Uh, I remember being in one protest and as we walked around and around in our circle, some guy, guess where he's from probably, was taking a picture of every single one of us as we walked around. So that was kind of the context there for the anti-war stuff. There was a lot of uh, interest in black white issues and that's how we described them in those days. And in the early years it was really about making relationships, building friendships, building a lot of social activities, doing things to try to have people communicate back and forth because LA was very segregated at that time. Uh, I grew up there and never really encountered black individuals until I got to college. So uh, it was a very different thing. But then eventually, as we all know, this became much more black power kind of thing. The whole mood changed at that point. There's a lot of concern about sexual freedom. This was a really big deal in Los Angeles at that time. A lot of group marriage, a lot of casual sex experimentation, so a lot of that. Uh, nothing really strongly about gay and lesbian issues at that time. There was some, but it really wasn't the dominant discourse at that time. A lot of drug experimentation. Uh, many of us who grew up there were not quite as involved as people who would come in from the Midwest and at UCLA is in graduate school there, we'd always know somebody coming in because the first thing they would do is get totally stoned on all kinds of different drugs and try them all out. Uh, so that was a big thing. And it also was the very beginnings of some feminist movement there. Uh, so that, that's the social context. Uh, so in the late 1960s, uh, oh wait, yeah. So one of the important things that happened during this era that I think many of you may have heard about was the Women's House. And this was an important art project that Judy Chicago started uh, where she brought, she had her students do two different things. She wanted them to express their feminist feelings in visual kinds of ways, but she also wanted them to learn some practical skills. And this is another big part of what was going on at that time, learning practical skills. So the women actually went and renovated a house. They took an old house that was falling down, no plumbing, no light, nothing in it. They renovated the house and they built this beautiful fantasy house with women's images in it. It was a wonderful kind of thing. The dinner party plates were there. It was, it was an exciting event for the whole city. So this got a lot of publicity, a lot of interest. Uh, that opened in 1971 and 72. I was just looking up the dates uh, last night of it. So in the late 60s, during all of this kind of format that was going on, there was a small group of women that worked to establish a women's center in Los Angeles. This was the first women's center in Los Angeles at that time. Uh, and I was part of that group. I was a student at that time. It was a really exciting kind of thing to be a part of. I, I, it was wonderful to do that. Uh, so one of the things that we were very interested in was education. And we saw education as a primary need. But it was interesting because most of the women there were much more concerned again about practical skills. So there were courses on things like changing tires. And we would bring community women in and offer these courses. And sometimes we even had to have men come in to teach them. 
because no women seem to be able to teach some of these classes. Uh, but as part of that, remember, this is community women. This is not academics, really. I was a graduate student, but I didn't really uh, act as an academic in this context. Uh, they were interested in classes, in formal classes. And I said, oh, I've been working on developing a psychology of women class. Would you like me to do that? Yes, we would love to have that. So we set up that class just for community women, just informal conversations. And there was such a hunger at that time just for basic knowledge. So those courses, of course, have grown. And I think you're going to be hearing more about those from Maureen and maybe others in the panel today. Uh, so Psychology Women courses got added to the course listings in many different schools around the country. Interesting, over time, the title tended to change to Psychology of Gender, which is an interesting political issue we may want to talk about later. Uh, initially, these courses were often affiliated with women's studies. but I'm finding that's less and less true, that many times these courses are not part of formal women's studies anymore. Uh, and sadly enough, the courses are starting to get dropped at many, of the, at many of the schools. So this is another kind of current trend that I find very distressing. Uh, there were also at that time, because there was such a hunger for knowledge, there was also a lot of books being written and published Rhoda Unger, of course, he wrote it. Can you just raise your hand since Rhoda is such a famous person here that is joining us? Uh, Rhoda one wrote some of the early books. I wrote an early book with a group of graduate students. We wrote a book. There were several other books being written at that time, textbooks uh, published in the 70s and the 80s. Rhoda actually wrote an article documenting all of these. No, you did that. Sexuals. Sexuals, yeah. Okay, Rhoda did that. Uh, and then we started to get more and more specialized books. So nowadays there's lots and lots of books, not only books that are on general psychology of women or psychology of gender, uh, but also much more specialized books. So I have one, for example, on violence and relationships. So we're getting more and more of these specialized books. So the literature has really grown enormously. Uh, some of the topics, it's interesting for me to look back and think about what topics did we talk about in those early books and what do we talk about nowadays? So in the early books, we talked about understanding our bodies with a big focus on hormones, uh, development of boys and girls, how do boys and girls develop, women's sexuality, but that really, we didn't deal much with gay and lesbian issues at that point, even though this is psychology of women. Women's achievement, it's an interesting topic then, but of course it was often about why women aren't achieving. Why don't women try to achieve? What's wrong with them? Uh, we tried to address that and talk about how achievement strivings might be expressed in other ways in the workplace. Mental health issues was something we wrote about in those days. And women in power was another topic that we wrote about. But that list of topics expands. Uh, so there was a topic of rape and power, uh, and that led to discussions of things like date rape, which was not part of this course in those early years. There was nothing about battered women in some of those very early years. In fact, the first time I even heard about that was uh, when some students came in the late 70s when I was already in Pittsburgh and told me about their experiences and wanted to study it. And we looked for literature and couldn't find anything. Uh, so that became a topic. Uh, that then dating violence came into the discourse, came into the literature and now, more recently, discussions of women's violence in close relationships. Because at first, the focus was always women as victims. Women are always the victims, men are always the perpetrators. But now we've learned that women can be violent, too. So our, our whole thinking has changed enormously on that topic. One of the early topics, again, contraception in with bodies, but contraception and abortion really weren't seriously discussed until later. Uh, effects of estrogen, much more discussion of that later. Discussion of women in the workforce, because now women were entering the workforce, but then that then became much more discussion of uh, women's leadership. So the topics have expanded as well. We're going to be hearing more on leadership from Suzanne. Uh, so the consciousness raising groups, which I said I was going to focus on today, but I think I probably won't focus on that today. Uh, we started meeting in small groups of women. This was part of that activity back in the LA Women's Center, and this was something I took on to organize these groups throughout the city. And our goal with these was to build a feeling of closeness with other women or to develop sisterhood. And that's one of the handouts I've given you. That's a Xerox of a mimeograph. The older people in the group will remember mimeographs that I actually found from that period. 
So that was my hand up from that period. I thought, well, I find that amusing just to see that. Uh, back from way back, and I don't know the exact date, but I think it's sometime in the late 60s. Uh, and you can see uh, what we were doing there is trying to build a personal understanding of discrimination. How does discrimination enter our lives? So the focus was much more building one's own self-knowledge, self-understanding, understanding of other women, and building closeness with other women, but not really used for political organizing in the way I've been hearing other sessions here, consciousness raising as you. So we used it in a very different way at that time. That changed over time, of course, but I'm talking about the very early years. So just to give you a flavor, uh, we structured them very carefully. One of the big concerns there was, will the women talk? Will they say anything? Because women weren't taught to speak in groups. And so we had to structure things very carefully to make sure everybody would talk. And nobody would dominate the conversation. So you had all these rules about how much people could talk and we do things like uh, have something maybe get passed around the group that everybody's supposed to talk and stuff. So we did a lot of things. And we also had a structured list of topics. And one side of the handout talks about the structure of groups, and the other side of the handout talks about the topics. And just to give you a flavor, it's amazing to me, when I look back at these topics, how relevant they are today. I think we could use exactly these same topics. What are your relationships with other women like? Uh, do you feel different from other women? Have you ever felt competition with other women? And I, I give you the list of topics we use there uh, to give you that. So we can talk more about this later if we have time. But, uh, And so for me, and I'm sure I speak for many members of AWP, AWP 
was a very special organization for feminists who didn't really fit in their other organizations, in their other uh, activities. So as an outsider, I think that's one reason I ended up writing the history, <coughs> because AWP has been spiritually incredibly important to me uh, as an outsider for all these many years. And uh, I, I consider it my professional home, my affinity group, and many, uh, many along me do. So I'm just going to speak about three uh, areas briefly. One is the context of the founding of the organization. Uh, the second is the precipitating events that caused the organization to actually come into being. And then third, the next 45 years. Uh, so first, uh, the context. So you may recall uh, that there was psychoanalysis, and then there was behaviorism, and then there was humanistic psychology. And it was the humanistic psychology phase of psychology in the 1960s that really sets the context in some ways for what was going on in psychology uh, prior to the founding of AWP, which is 1969. That's the year we're going to get to in a minute. But you know, we've heard a lot about what else was going on, the anti-war movement and the student movement and the um, civil rights movement. But I don't think anyone has mentioned humanistic psychology. Uh, yeah, so allow me to be the first. So there was this ferment going on within the mental health field, and it was, it was territorialities, of course, between psychiatrists and psychoanalysts and the newer areas, some of which were more female involved, social work and so on. But then there were these really major uh, challenges from people like R.D. Lang or Thomas Sachs, all of which, which were saying uh, the way things have been uh, are not the way things ought to be. So then we get the activities that we've heard about a lot in the conference so far, the women's liberation movement activities of the early 1960s, the commission, um, Betty for Dan now, and so on. So those are fermenting around. And uh, we have a lot of psychologists who were participating in the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, and so on, learning a variety of skills uh, and coming to meetings of the American Psychological Association and saying, you know, what's going on here? What's going on here with peace? What's going on here with um, multiculturalism, whatever it was called back in those days, and what's going on here with women? And so that brings us to 1968, 69, uh, 68 in Chicago, you recall, was uh, incredible, important year for the country. It was also important because psychology was there, and uh, th these things began coming to a head. Let me just mention one other thing. I'm sorry, I should have put it in earlier, which is there actually is a past forgotten history of women in psychology, women forming an organization on their own behalf within psychology, called the National Council of Women in Psychology, which was started during the war, World War II, especially because of inequities in the field. And it never really um, sustained itself, unfortunately. It tried to become a division of the American Psychological Association, was turned down in 48, was turned down in 58, was turned down in 59, and got subsumed into another organization. And everyone has forgotten that. Sort of like first wave feminism, you know, it's like rediscovering that might tell us some interesting stories and certainly will introduce us to some interesting people. Okay, so back to 68, 69. So there was a workshop in 1969 at the American Psychological Convention called Woman as Subject, uh, sponsored by the, Psycho the Chicago Psychologists for Social Action, who were part of a peace group. And uh, there was a lot of excitement, apparently, at that uh, conversation. It led to a rap session that went on for many hours with activist groups coming together and discussing why was there so much sexism within psychology? Why weren't we talking about it? What could we do about it? So one a decision that came out of that was to set up a booth next to the Job Placement Center, always a, a hub of excitement at the American Psychological Association. And that booth would give information about um, 
how to interview, how to challenge sexism, how to identify sexism, and in fact then uh, a petition was sent to APA and there were major changes made in the advertising of jobs within the um, job placement center, elimination of male jobs and female jobs. Big, big movement, big movement happening though elsewhere, newspapers and so on, but there it was happening right at APA. Uh, petitions were also put together for hiring things, where's my list, hiring, uh, repealing criminal statutes against abortion, calling for childcare, endless petitions. Um, things were not going to go very far and by the third day of the convention, a group of people getting together, people, not just women, people getting together decided that if women's issues were going to go forward, an organization needed to be founded. And so it was in the middle of the American Psychological Association that this independent organization, the Association for Women, was founded. Okay, 1969 to 2014 is a very long time, but I don't want to just sort of stay at the beginning, you know, the issues were the issues we've heard about for the last couple of days. The personalities were, as you would expect, larger than life, uh, unforgettable, um, and important to remember. But what happened in the subsequent years is also extremely interesting. That there have been um, continuing uh, struggles within the organization that have reflected uh, the philosophy philosophical issues that we hear so much about in the rest of the movement. For example, this issue of structure. What kind of a structure should this organization have? Well, the, the, the con conflicts go on to this day, uh, but suffice it to say that at the very beginning, there were officers elected and they would speak for the organization and they would put forward the petitions. And that lasted for a while but there were a constant uh, calls to revisit the structure, come up with a different structure, let's have committees, <coughs> let's not have officers, let's not have elitism, let's not have centralization. All of these philosophical issues, how do they work out on the ground if you actually want to have an organization that walks the walk and doesn't just talk the talk? And so after a number of years, finally, this organization evolved with its, its current structure that we think is holds truthfully to the initial feminist impulses without being unworkable. This is still an organization without elections, without officers, without a central office, uh, with no hired people. Sometimes people are hired to do tasks, but basically it is an all volunteer organization that has sustained itself for 45 years because of commitment and, and uh, participation and mentoring, training, support um, uh, on the ground. So the struggle over structure, hierarchy, centralization, uh, a, big, a big problem. Conferences came along several years after the organization began. Um, at first, the organization kind of just met at the um, American Psychological Association, and then there were um, midwinter conferences that were all about policy. And then the midwinter conferences morphed into content uh, along with policy. And that happened within the first five or six years. People were saying, well, what kind of research should we do? What kind of clinical work should we do? Let me, I want to tell you what I'm doing. Let me show you what I'm writing. Let me complain about how things are going at my institution. Uh, and let's have sessions. And let's have um, uh, papers. And let's have uh, speakers. And let's have experiential sessions. So the idea of the personal being political, how that would play out in a conference, in an organization, has been, again, an ongoing Question. People do not wish to sit around and be bored. They do not wish to sit around and bitch all the time. On the other hand, they do wish to express themselves and share. 
and you don't want to just share in between sessions, you want to figure out a way to share during the sessions, and to try to invent that, I think, has been uh, one of our triumphs. Feminist therapy, research, pedagogy have all been major, uh, major subjects. Regional caucuses, many, many come and go. Special interest groups, many, many come and go. It depends what's hot at the time. Is motherhood hot? Is aging hot? Is mentoring hot? You know, things come and go. And in a volunteer organization, as many of you know maybe, who work in a faith community, uh, things go if there's a person who wants them to go. And that's what's happened in our voluntary organization. If somebody is big on something, it'll happen and it'll sustain itself, and maybe it'll pick up and fly, but more often it won't. And so the interesting thing of uh, topics that come and go has been fascinating to me as well. Um, psychology, as you all may know, has changed over the last 45 years, and, psych and psychology has gone through phases, you know, it's no longer the great humanistic uh, thrusts that it had back in the, in the 60s, neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, prescribing rights, and so on. And uh, AWP has provided a sanctuary. I, I choose that word carefully, because that's how I think of it. A sanctuary to talk about these things in all their complexity, uh, without fear of um, attack, or being, being um, blackballed or being fired. Difficult subjects. Uh, psych psychology is, is an important uh, topic for both objective and subjective reasons. And we've tried to keep it honest uh, by dealing with the subjective, objective topics ourselves. So then in conclusion, what would I see as some of the victories? Besides mere survival, which, uh, as those of us who are in this room can attest, mere survival counts for a lot. But other than the organization surviving, what have we accomplished? Well, I would say one, and this is where I think the chorus of, of those present will add, but one of the most important things is that it provided a, a safe place for those of us who felt like outsiders in other places to come and feel like we belong and to have friendships and to have intellectual companions uh, along the way, to practice our ideas, try them out, uh, and uh, without being afraid of, of uh, being attacked in any way. So the sanctuary thing, I think, is I would put number one. Number two is we have done, I think, an extraordinary job with multiculturalism and anti-racism. Starting in 1989, when the organization kind of woke up to the fact that it was a white women's organization, it made consistent and continuous and successful efforts to figure out how, how do you change something like that. And there have been trainings, and there have been workshops, and there are trainings, and there are workshops. And this now is an organization that is truly inclusive. And um, the Women of Color section, uh, would, would uh, we were to tell just that story, we'd have a very interesting story from 1989. But suffice it to say, from a position of uh, you know, challenge and antagonism and outsidership, uh, things have really moved along. A third story is sort of the lesbian and straight story. Um, every survey that's kind of done about AWP every once in a while, it's like surveys of Unitarians that show like quarter of them are atheists and this and that. The surveys of AWP show that about half the women are straight, about half the women are lesbian. Uh, and it's, there are men, you know, transgender people, but the majority of women who identify as straight or lesbian. And this has been uh, just an enormous support of friendship and nothing, uh, there have been no heterosexual caucuses, you know, that we've needed to have, or homosexual caucuses that we've needed to have, I think that's been a tremendous victory. So it's been a safe space to bring students, to practice ideas, and really to put our, our philosophy into action. We continue to meet annually uh, with an all-volunteer organization, an all-volunteer conference, uh, and it's really, um, I wish, the, I wish the website told 
this story in better detail. But for those of us who've lived it, it's been a crucial part of our lives. about today is um, to what extent can research, qualitative or otherwise, contribute to our feminist goals of transforming society and moving toward gender equality? You know, some feminists have questioned the liberation potential of research and especially the possibility of traditional, that is, experimental, quantitative or objective research to produce knowledge that will alleviate gender inequality or um, women's oppression. Others view feminism and science as in conflict, but argue that in this conflict between feminism and science could end up to be both productive and transformative. So I'm going to look at this question about the ways in which feminist researchers in psychology have, um, are, have worked for the transformation of both psychology, science, research in general, and ultimately of society. Interpretations to one sex. 
And so here are some of the individuals that Joan mentioned, Naomi Weinstein, who was one of the first, and she had an impact on me and many others in terms of you know speaking to truth. The idea that psychology had very little to say about women in an excellent, always read article. And also Carolyn Sharif, who we worked with, Irene and I, she was the uh, president of the Division on Psychology of Women at the time, and she wrote a famous essay that's also often read by us in psychology, commenting on the thoroughness through the research methods, theories, et cetera, of how psychology really was completely biased. And also she um, commissioned or created a task force to look at the ways in which psychology was sexist and how we might uh, make some kind of rules or comments on how we uh, might not be sexist anymore. And that's uh, a task force that Irene and I worked on. And I also wanted to mention the work of Stephanie Shields in this uh, excellent essay from 75. She pointed on very specific ways in which psychology had been sexist. Research that had been done, what their thinking was, and what the flaws in it is, you know, like why women have smaller brains, that's why they're not as smart, and then brain size is proportional to body size, and once you take that proportion into account, women have larger brains, but then they realize, of course, brain size had no connection to intellectual capacity. <laughs> this is just one of the many <laughs> errors that she points out for us. So feminist psychology is more than just non-sexist psychology. Um, but it started off by challenging, as I was mentioning, sexism. So it challenged Freud, which now seems so easy a case, but was important at the time. Challenged psychological diagnosis and challenged the delivery of psychotherapy. So th these are outside research in a sense, but I wanted to mention them. I think they were important uh, at the time. Here's some examples. Karen Hoare and I, who predated, in some ways, feminist psychology, but she did write a book. It wasn't published, republished fully until 67 after her death, which I think she died in 52. But she challenged Freud on a very basic level and thought he was wrong about female personality. This is Phyllis Chesler, who believed that women were punished through labels and institutionalization for not conforming to gender roles. A very important book. And um, here's Paula Kaplan, who has consistently over the years and continues today to challenge um, diagnosis um, by the psychiatric community. Um, here's three famous ones, but she is really working, continuing to work hard in this field with the publication of DSM-5. She's still on the job. Uh, so those were about therapy, uh, diagnosis, and interventions. I wanted to spend more time talking about research, starting with uh, this, this, this is the traditional method um, from a critical perspective, that the researcher controls the situation, manipulates the independent variable, observes the participant as a subject to object, interprets the results according to his or her own values, and this method has been challenged as inauthentic, reductionistic, and completely removed from social context. And so some people have really questioned its validity or importance of overall, but certainly did seem like the path to liberation of women to, have, to conduct study in this way. So feminist psychology has challenged this research and much research as sexist, it's offered some correctives, and it has attempted to um, conduct research that would challenge sexism, so point out stereotypes that aren't true, but also move us forward toward the end of oppression and toward gender equality. So I mentioned Irene and I were on this task force to uh, find non-sexist guidelines for conducting non-sexist research. And that research was published in 1986. So really, we, through most of the 80s, we were working on it one way or another. And here's another 
um, person who wrote extensively on the general problems, Carol Pavis is writing on the general problems of why the research. The name is G-A-V. I know, I have it wrong. I always have them wrong, but I thought I fixed it. Sorry, thank you very much. Okay. So this is what feminist research strives to be, to conduct research that's really of interest to women and works for the advancement of women. It gives voice to women's own experience in their own voice. Uh, of course, generally puts women or gender at the center of the inquiry. Tries to produce knowledge that would challenge gender inequities and works for social change. So this is a couple of ideas. I mean, there's other ones to extend this. So one of the one of the ideas then in the development of um, feminist research is the first part I already talked about that there's something wrong with the traditional kind of logical positive research. Some people continue to use it to try to challenge um, stereotypes. Um, but a second idea that develops out of the guidelines and out of the critique is that when women, when men are working on, on questions about women, that possibly they have a bias or value perspective, and that women might have a different perspective. So if you think that women would do the research differently or ask different questions, that starts to bring you to a place called standpoint theory. And the idea of standpoint theory is that men and women have different interests, have different perspectives, have different questions, and might produce different kinds of research. Um, so it's based on that idea, one idea is that women are outside to most of the dominant paradigms, including the scientific one, and as outsiders, they see things differently. Or then that women researchers are both insiders and outsiders, which is sometimes referred to as double consciousness, and they might see things so this is the standpoint theory. I have an example, uh, Carol Gilligan in a different voice, which is really embraced by the women's movement even more so than feminist psychology because we had our own dilemmas with this idea about the insider-outsider. And also uh, Patricia Hill Collins, um, I think as a sociologist, but she really uh, developed this idea about black feminist thought that black women also had their own lens by which they viewed the world, and they could come to different kind of conclusions about their own experience than, say, a white male would. Okay, so you can see that important in here, and this has come up in other sessions, is overall challenge to objectivity. You know, the idea is, for many of us, that objectivity is not really possible in the way that it's purported to exist, and that it's not a good thing to be completely impartial and neutral. First of all, it's impossible, and maybe that's not the best position from which to conduct research, but that the illusion or the claim of objectivity has given science and scientists power. They have the power to construct the reality and claim what's truth. And so in some ways, feminist psychology that challenges this objectivity is an attempt to take that power back or away. And one response to this is social construction, the idea that knowledge is socially produced <coughs> and emphasizes the relation between research and power and between knowledge and power. And it says, who gets to ask which questions and whose interests are served by the research and by the answer. And social construction, has transformed intellectual inquiry. So everybody doesn't subscribe to it, but it has had a really strong impact on research. And here's Leonore Kiefer, a member of our panel, who is a social constructionist and who has, asked if, has stated that sex is not a natural act. This is her book named that. And that's where she takes up the social construction of sex and how the human response cycle by Masters and Johnson's is a construction and it's had a certain kind of impact and some of it has not been good for uh, women. Okay, so in general, I have um, worked <coughs> looking at, I'm not gonna do much here, but the idea that qualitative methods are really important for moving research on women forward 
because qualitative methods are designed to give the respondents or the women involved with the phenomena or experience the power of words. So marginalized women especially are, have often been silenced, so their experience is interpreted for them or for us. And the idea is to try to move move the uh, research so that they're talking about their own experience. And even, uh, right, even women psychologists can be interpreting, labeling, or somehow modifying uh, their experience through our own lens and our own experiences. So this is something that we're trying to work with. And so one of the ways that we uh, work with it is the idea that we all have values, positions, roles, and a perspective on the world, and one way to work with this is to make our perspective known. See, this is counter to the idea of omniscient, objective, truth-telling male. Okay, no, we're all involved, and we'll tell you how we're involved, why we're passionate about the topic. For example, Jane Usher, in one book, talks about her own mother's uh, mental illness as a starting place for why she's interested in women and madness. Okay. So um, one idea is all research, whether it's qualitative or not, we assume the power to name. This has been important in terms of our functioning as feminist psychologists. We have named things like battering, date, rape, stalking, uh, sexual assault, sexual coercion. But the point is these are our names, and once we give them to the experience of women, it directs and impacts their own conception of what happened to them. So it's uh, complicated. Power. Okay, I have one more important thing. Let's see, I'll uh, skip intersectionality. A new uh, approach is to explore the everyday, and I think this is consistent with feminist emphasis on practices like um, the study of home, relationships. These are kinds of things that women might be interested in that haven't been addressed because they don't fit with the control or experimental method. And here's my last point is that um, the transformation of society begins with knowledge. And traditional approaches to knowledge have confirmed and constructed and or contain women's lives. And to transform science is the step forward in terms of dismantling male dominance. And uh, this is from Warner. Take the unthought and ask the question. Jane's 
mistake that the University of Missouri St. Louis, one of my colleagues for many years, and I uh, did some research on whether women's studies courses increased activism. And Jane also went into do some national studies of this, where we looked to see if students pre and post women's studies courses compared to students in a non women's studies course were more activist in terms of these measures. Now, some of them aren't very activist oriented way of trying to assess whether the students were active. Keep themselves uh, informed of women's rights, influence others' attitudes, sign a petition, attend a march or rally or protest, <coughs> circulate a petition, work for a phone bank, letter writing or campaign or political campaign, or participate in some other creative activity related to women's rights. So in terms of consciousness raising, I think you want two things to happen. You want attitude change, you want people to be more aware of their own situation and how it's affected by gender and structural aspects of the society, race and class. Uh, also, you want some kind of critical analysis to develop in the students. So you want them to have some understanding or new perspective on why things are the way they are. And then hopefully they can translate this into action as the next step. So for the several studies that we did, we found that there was no difference in the level of activism in the students at the beginning of a women's studies class compared to a non-women's studies class. But by the end of the course, the women's studies students were more activist in terms of being more informed about women's rights issues, attempting to influence others, and signing petitions, letter writing, and doing other activities. And they were also, uh, show a significant change in our own personal experience, more willing to adopt new, adopt new roles and behaviors. They thought these changes were positive, and they thought in the future they would be more likely to engage in feminist activism. This is a pretty good result for one course. So we hope that majors, women studies majors, would be more uh, convinced of this. I just wanted to read a few quotes of some of the changes. One student said, I have learned the overt and subtle ways in which people, including women, discriminate against women. My senses are more acute now. I watch people's behavior much more carefully. Another said, I speak of imbalances between women and men with more feeling and assuredness. And one said, it has made me tell my fiance to do more cooking and cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some examples. I think those are uh, pretty, they sound like small changes, but they're actually uh, pretty big steps for many people in these classes. Well, I wanted to take this a bit further and actually teach students how to do some activism. So I had different assignments uh, pertaining to the protest, teaching the protest. Sometimes it's been in a small class where there's been a class assignment for this. And sometimes it's been part of an internship <coughs> program where the assignment is to organize some type of event. So um, these are the kind of things I ask the students to do, to write a letter of complaint, to confront a person or institution directly, to organize a campaign. And you know, you would think this would be a little easier than it was, but even in an upper level women's studies class uh, where there's a lot of support for how to do this, I found that some people really had difficulty thinking what they would do. Uh, one woman in one class never could think of anything at the end of the semester, I suggested, well, why don't you write a letter of praise to somebody for something? <laughs> and she did write to a local station and uh, give them and compliment them for doing a segment on battered women. But she could now, it astounded to me that she couldn't think of what to do. But uh, nevertheless, it is an interesting uh, process to go through this and have people identify, you know, part of it is identifying the problem and deciding what steps you're going to take. So here are some of the things you have to be careful about in, in helping develop political strategy. I have this quote from Jill Johnston Passivity is the dragon each woman must slay in her quest for independence. I felt that was the dragon I was trying to slay. In every class, I tried to teach the protest to get women to step up. So what issue to choose is the first thing. Who is responsible for the oppression, oppression, so they have to do the critical analysis. What are the best outlets for the message? This takes some investigation sometimes. What's the best use of one's energy? And are students prepared for the consequences of their actions? And is the Professor compared to the consequences of the students' actions. And I think it's even harder now to do things because there's so much retaliation. Uh, one woman protested a sexy legs con for uh, sexy leg 
this contest. She just wrote a letter to the student paper, and she got such vicious responses in the student paper, she just didn't practically terrorize. So you have to do a lot of caregiving when you're working with people on this, because they may not have that emotional stamina to take the backlash they're going to get. But the backlash is instructive, because then they know, they understand that the oppression is real and consequential in a way that it's not just something you can talk about politely. So uh, I organized a couple of events. We would, um, an internship program, uh, you know, Florida has not passed the Equal Rights Amendment, and it's been many years. Um, so I decided even though this is lobbying, it's not really a dramatic protest, it was very emotional for the students. Um, so I would take a group of interns, they would have to research the history of the Equal Rights Amendment. Most of them didn't know, did not know that we don't have equal rights. So, they were stunned. They would have to prepare fact sheets, so this was an academic enterprise for them. Organizing the travel, trying to teach some good feminist activism skills. I mean, having to find out the hotel and the airline and the, or renting a van or what we're doing and stuff and to do everything. Organize the travel day, prepare the itinerary, figure out which legis legislators we were going to see, and then we'd have a deep brief afterwards. And this is us in front of the Florida State Capitol. The first group was small. Uh, we did expand. It's, it's nine hours from Miami to Tallahassee, so nine to ten hours drive. And it's very expensive to fly. So it's kind of limited how many people we can take at any one time. The students' reactions, very proud that they went and talked to their legislators. Uh, very shocked by the reaction of legislators saying, putting their arm, men putting their arm around the young women and saying, I love women, I love my wife and daughter. <laughs> and that was their view of the Equal Rights Amendment. It, did, it wasn't needed. Anger, solidarity. The third activity I had uh, was working for cross-racial awareness and friendship um, in um, lectures on the psychology of women edited by Joan one of the authors. She has a chapter on this exercise that I did in the classroom. I would try to get the students to think about their cross-race relationships. Imagine being a person of another race, waking up in the morning, walking out your door. Would it be a comfortable neighborhood if you were another race? Uh, the second assignment would be to ask them to go to a children's section of any bookstore and look at what books are available for other race children. Read a magazine women of color if you're white. You don't have to tell women of color to read a white magazine and they'll read that. Going to a church service for another predominantly racial group and that was often surprising if they went to a Baptist service. They could be there for many hours. On Sunday they said, oh my God, I didn't know I'd be there for five hours. <laughs> or they could write about their cross-race friendships. And in Miami, it's very multicultural. People think they have cross-race friendships. When you ask them, have you ever had that person to your house or done anything really social with them? A lot of times they haven't had. So, some other extracurricular activities that have built cross-race friendships. The Vagina Model Loans has been a great way for students to come together. This is um, one of our group. Uh, it's a very powerful experience for them. Uh, some of the family members refuse to come and see the students because it's too sexual, they're embarrassed. One Billion Rising campaign at E. Gensler's Justice for All Survivors of Gender Violence. These kind of things can also build a cross-race relation. So I want to end with um, some questions about the future of activism in academia. Is there a declining interest in having activist activities? I, I don't think many faculty are focusing on this. It's wonderful to see this conference, though, ever about it, certainly provide some activist opportunities by having this and having students involved. But on a daily basis, I don't know how many classes are really focusing on it. Uh, there seems to be an erosion of space and opportunities for women. Uh, a lot of <coughs> women's studies programs have dropped the word women and become gender and sexuality studies. We want to be inclusive, but in terms of being inclusive, we don't want to lose sight of a core mission, but maybe we don't have a core mission. 
there seem to be uh, less focus on women's specific interests, like abortion and reproductive justice in our classes, economic justice, equal pay, comparable worth. I mean, I'm all for discussing philosophy, but I also want to talk about concrete economic issues. Collective action, I don't hear much about that in the women's studies classroom. And indeed, it's difficult to tell the feminist stance of some various organizations. So when I have students, I'm trying to encourage them to maybe affiliate with a nonprofit. For instance, I talked to one lesbian, she was advocating for the human rights campaign, which has a focus on gay lesbian rights and is really a big proponent of same-sex marriage. And I said, do you know the human rights campaign will support candidates who don't support abortion? And they're not pro-choice, because they made a decision some years ago to just focus on candidates that supported gay and lesbian rights. But I consider abortion a lesbian right. <laughs> so, you know, and people don't know those kind of things. So if you want to support the students in doing what they do, you might want to encourage them to investigate to see do they really embrace all of the mission of the organization, or are they happy with that one mission? And there's a lot more emphasis on individual solutions.
she is very racially, um, ethnically, class inclusive. It's just a wonderful archive. And I had some uh, good flyers, but I gave them a while ago. It's www.psychology. Yeah. Yeah.
We'll let our violence researcher take that. Thanks a lot. Uh, I find that very frustrating. I, I teach a course, I used to teach a course on women violence in my psychology department, and the students don't sign up for it. This is an undergraduate but course. But the problem is it's not part of the fundamental curriculum, so while that's a terrible Well, that's what I'm problem. saying. You and I taught it as an upper level psychology course that would count for an advanced psychology course. The psychology students are so trained now to be interested in other things that they didn't sign up for it. To even be able to teach the class, I had to bring in social work students. So it's just not part of, of the current discourse. It looks like we're in class this season. Yeah. Well, the APA is having a psychology and the law where they're going to talk something about this. But also at my institution, IEP, I brought some flyers, but I don't have them here. We're having, uh, it's called a REACH conference, but actually it's violence education and we're trying to offer CEs for, you know, like lawyers, teachers, people in the community. And it's based on a violence education model for both, you know, retraining or CE kind of training, but also an undergraduate certificate violence education. So that's very helpful. So we can, what can be done to integrate this into the fundamental what I think if you put, put stuff questions like about domestic violence on the licensure exam, this is one of the strategies that we found over the years. If there are questions on the licensure exam, then there will be courses and lectures that will be. So licensure exam, this is a state by state matter, you know, so you want to get the local psychological organizations involved. This is a, not the easiest thing. You know, from the central organizations, you know, we can have curricula, we can have workshops, and so on, but implementation is going to be on a state level when it comes to life. Tell us on that, so how that exam is changed. Well, I think that's one way to nail it down. That's, that's the way that professional organizations have gone about it, you know, putting things that they think are important, and then it gets back into the training program. So this is a perfect question to end the session with because it just reminds us that we're not finished. You, you do all of this research, you raise all of this consciousness about intimate partner violence, and then you turn to something else for a few minutes and all of a sudden it's gone. Mm -hmm. So we need to have feminists out there keeping an eye on things, bringing it up again, getting into positions of power on those licensing boards and in the curriculum development and doing site visits to graduate programs and asking the troubling questions. And that's the only way we're going to keep our games and keep moving forward. So I think we're out of time, but thank you all so much for coming.